Welcome to today's lesson. Uh, we're going to be looking at some A-level physical education today, or A-level PE. Uh, in particular, we are going to be focusing on the anatomy and physiology side of things, and even more, uh, particularly we are going to be looking at the respiratory system. So all the different control mechanisms, be it neurological, be it intrinsic, uh, be it hormonal, we're going to be looking at different things and mechanisms inside of our body that control respiration and then how that impacts our performance in sport. So hopefully by the end of this, we should be running for about 40, 45 minutes. There's a couple of breakout sessions um, or breakout uh, periods during this lesson uh, for which if you look in the, in the links below or attached uh, to this video, then you will be able to find either the slides to this or the, or what well, the slides to this and then within the slides, uh, you can find the activities which should help solidify some of your understanding that you gain from, from this lesson today. So without further ado, we are going to get straight into it. And sort of the first thing that we need to need to be aware of in, in the respiratory system are a few of these a few of these things here. So we've got lung volumes and capacities. We have gas exchange, we have that hormonal, neural, chemical control or regulation which I just mentioned there. Uh, we've also got pulmonary ventilation and how you know, muscles engage to actually cause air to come in and out of our body. And then we've also got at the end some lifestyle choices which can impact negatively on, our, on the quality of our respiratory system. So we've got sort of five, five things there which we are going to be running through. And if we kick it off with uh, sort of just an understanding of the, of the different lung volumes that exist inside of our body, and we'll, and we'll take it from there. So, um, well, we have two different terms that we use, uh, volume and capacity. Volume and capacity. So it could be uh, vital capacity, it could be uh, tidal volume. Uh, so we have these two different phrases, and the, the key difference is volume refers to one body of air, whereas capacity is, is almost a figure or a sum, you know, it's a combination of a couple of separate volumes that interact or add together to then create a capacity. So for example, if we just whiz through a couple of them here, by the way, if you, uh, you should be able to click on some of the links within the slide. So if you do click on the link below this video, uh, these, these links should take you to some external videos to sort of go into even more detail um, of, of what we're doing here today. So we've got minute ventilation. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the starting point really, which is it's this, the sum or the combination of our breaths per minute or our breathing rate multiplied by our tidal volume. So VE, which is minute ventilation, not the easiest acronym to remember, but VE stands for minute ventilation. And it's the total volume of air that we breathe in per minute. So it's, this, it's down to this relationship between how many breaths we take per minute, so the frequency of our breath, and then each time we do breathe, how much air do we breathe in or out each time? So if we were to multiply those together, we would end up with one large volume of air that comes in and out of our lungs per minute. That's our minute ventilation. So I, I just mentioned it there, the tidal volume, this, this volume of air that's breathed in or out per breath. Okay, so at the moment you're, you're breathing. Okay, I'm breathing, hopefully everyone's breathing. Um, and the, the amount of air that's coming in and out at this resting level, that's your tidal volume. Just like water at the beach or along the coast, there's a tide and it washes in and washes out the same distance. I know obviously we then have you know, the tide coming in or the tide going out, but we could apply that to breathing as well because our tidal volume can gradually increase in the amount that we breathe in when we start to exercise. And then when we turn to rest, then our tidal volume starts to decrease again. So tidal volume, the volume of air that's breathed in or out per breath. And now what we have here is our IRV and our ERV. And like I just said where the tide could go in or out, we have, there must be space inside the lungs for this tidal volume to change into. So for example, if we are resting now and we, we breathe in a normal breath, breathe out a normal breath, beyond our normal breath in or our normal breath out, we have the capability to breathe more in or breathe more out. We have the ability to dip into this reserve space, this, this reserve volume. 
And if we do dip into those reserve spaces and reserve volumes, then that's how we start to increase our tidal volume. So if, and you'll see plenty of these diagrams during this lesson, if I quickly just draw this on the little black pen, there we go. Uh, so if I were to draw sort of our regular breaths in, where we have in, out, in, out, in. So that's our regular resting breath. And up the side here, so along this y-axis, is the amount of air inside the lungs. So air in the lungs. So when we breathe in, obviously we've got more air inside the lungs. When we breathe out, this trough in the wave, then we've got less air inside the lungs. So whenever we're exercising, we want to start to increase our tidal volume. So we can actually start to breathe in and use this zone up here, this amount of space above our normal breath in. And when we breathe out, we can dip below our resting tidal volume and we can make use of this space inside of our lungs. We can exhale this extra body of air. So these are our reserves, our inspiratory when we breathe in and our expiratory when we expire, in, exit, inspiration, expiration. So we will, we will cover those sorts of diagrams in far more detail um, this lesson, but just to just sort of give you an intro really to how it, how it can look. So we've got tidal volume, the amount of air that we breathe in or out per breath. We've got the inspiratory reserve volume, which is the volume of air available to breathe in following normal tidal volume. And then we have ERV, expiratory reserve volume, the amount of air that we could, that we could exhale following normal breath out. To a point, okay, so that blue line there, that can dip low, but there's always going to be some air left inside of our lungs because we've got these things called alveoli inside of our lungs. You, you probably come across this term in either GCC or BTEC or maybe some biology as well. The alveoli are like a bubble wrap. So you've got sort of sheets and groups and you know this 3D bubble wrap, also called alveoli. And if we were to compress it completely down, then those thin, thin-walled alveoli air sacs, these bubbles, they would actually stick together and start to break. So we always need to leave some air inside of our lungs to keep them slightly inflated. If we were to exhale or crush our lungs too much, then that would cause damage. And the volume of air that stays inside of our lungs or resides in our lungs for the whole time is our residual volume. So we've got IRV, ERV, residual volume. From the point of maximum expiration, so we've just, we've just breathed out as much as we can, we've expired maximally, we've got obviously the residual volume still inside of our lungs. If we were to then take that point as zero and take a maximum inspiration, a maximum inhalation, the amount of air that we can breathe in from that maximum exhalation to the maximum inhalation, that is our vital capacity. Okay, it's the volume of air, the body of air, or the space inside of our lungs that we can use to live off. Okay, it's vital for survival, or it, con um, it contributes to our vitality. So vital capacity. The amount of air inside of our lungs minus the residual volume, minus the amount of air that always has to be there. And lastly, total lung capacity. We've got everything. So if you were to just breathe in maximally, the volume of air inside of your lungs at that moment in time is your total lung capacity. Why isn't it total lung volume? Well, because if we go back to that green line up at the top, a capacity is when we combine different volumes together. So we've got the residual volume plus the expirate Residual volume down here, expirate plus the expiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume creates this new figure of total lung capacity. 
So this diagram might make things a little bit clearer if I move, I move myself out of the way for you. So we've got this red line. And as you can see, we've got this resting level of in, out, in, out. And if you look on the right-hand side of this graph, you can see the various, you know, the various, the various parts to this, this line. So if we start from, it probably easier to start from the right-hand side of it, really, TLC, total lung capacity, so that what we've just been looking at there, where we've got the top part and we've got the bottom part here. So this whole area from top to bottom signifies our total lung capacity. Tidal volume, this smaller area here, this smaller section. So the volume of air, whenever the line is up and down between this smaller zone, that is our tidal volume. And just like you can see behind me, we've got that red zone and the blue zone. Well, the red zone would be above. That's our inspiratory reserve volume. And the blue zone would be here, the expiratory reserve volume. From the base of the tidal volume down to the top of the residual volume. Now, it's probably a hot, there's probably loads of words coming at you here, especially if this is the first time that you're, that you're covering it. So I would definitely recommend sort of just, just either pausing the video and just having a look at this graph here and making sense of it. Okay, but what we are going to be doing uh, later in this lesson is sort of ascribing and drawing our way through different spirometer traces so we do get an idea of how this line reacts to exercise, rest, and, and different intensity movements. So, to sort of summarise where we've got to so far, really, are these definitions. And if you if you are writing things down, then this this is what you want to be this is what you want to be noting down. So minute ventilation is that volume of air breathed in or out per minute, uh, breathing rate times tidal volume. Tidal volume is the volume of air that we breathe in each breath. Total lung capacity. If we do a maximum inhalation, it's the volume of air inside of our lungs at that point in time. If we were to then do a maximum exhalation, whatever's left, whatever's left residing inside of our lungs, residual volume. Vital capacity. It's the volume of air, total lung capacity, minus the residual volume. It's the, it's the, space, the space in which that we can actually inhale and exhale in to utilise during exercise. And then we've got our IRV and our ERV. The spaces either side or above and below our tidal volume markers. So, if you can, pause it. Obviously, if you're watching live, then I would recommend revisiting this uh, or using the slides and, and, and just recapping this and noting down and just getting to grips with what this graph actually means and where the zones on the graph are for each definition. So, pulmonary ventilation. The exchange of air between the lungs and the surrounding atmosphere. We're not talking about gas exchange, we're not talking about internal respiration, we're not talking about O2 and CO2, we're talking about this vent. Normal air, you know, this, this mixture, this cocktail of nitrogen, CO2, oxygen, all the gases. This is coming into our body and we're exhaling a similar mixture. A little bit different with O2 and CO2 and things like that but it's this exchange of bog standard fresh air in and out of our body. That is pulmonary ventilation. So inspiration and expiration. So if I'll move myself across here. So fresh air that enters the lungs and is inside this batch of fresh air. That's where we then get our oxygen and it's where we can dump the CO2 that we've been producing inside of our body. So it's, it's a carrier. It's almost like you know, a bus. You know, a bus comes in and it drops off some passengers, it picks up some new ones and then it takes them away again. So we need to be able to get these, these, these volumes of air in and out of our body all the time when we're resting, when we're exercising, when we're recovering, because it supplies oxygen and it can remove CO2. Now what we're going to be talking about is, well how do we actually control that? 
how do we actually get air in and air out? Because we don't, we don't magically, you know, just just absorb air into us. There's there's some science behind it. There's there's, there's reasons for it, and the term that we give to it inside of the body is the mechanics of breathing. So the mechanics of breathing, that's what we're going to be looking at now. So if I just come up back up there, so the mechanics of breathing. How do we actually move the body in such a way that we can draw air in? So it refers to the mechanisms, it, it refers to the structures, it refers to the muscular actions. It refers to the, the movement of the ribs and the lungs and the pressure changes. You know, how do we actually manipulate our body to create an environment that draws air in? That's what, that's what the mechanics of breathing is all about. And without this, well, tidal volume or anything to do with our vital capacity or breathing rate or minute ventilation, it can't change. And if our minute ventilation, volume of air that we breathe in per minute, if we can't adapt our mid ventilation, then we can't adapt to, or respond, I should say, to the effects of exercise. We can't respond to the increased demands of oxygen and overproduction of CO2. So we need to be able to control our pulmonary ventilation. So we've got this, we've got this table, and I would highly recommend writing, storing, and remembering the mechanics of breathing in this format. It's so easy to, to sort of compartmentalise the different, the different parts to it, and you'll start to see patterns as well. So if you can get one box memorised and understood, then quite often the others are just mirrors, reflections, or the inverse of, of that one box. So we'll start with at rest, and we'll look at inspiration. So how do we actually breathe in at rest? Well, we've got the diaphragm. Now the diaphragm is, is muscle at the base of our rib cage, this sort of dome, this disc. And it, in its resting state, it's in this upward shape, this upward dome. And if we were to contract it, it flattens, it draws down. Okay? Now, that's all you need to know for the time being. It flattens and, and moves down. The external intercostal muscles, intercostal, sorry, they contract. Now we've got two different types of intercostal muscles. Okay, intercostals being around our rib cage, sort of muscles around the ribs. So if you've ever, if you've ever had like I don't know, beef ribs, for example, what you're actually having is the intercostal muscle of whatever animal, or pork ribs, or whatever. So the intercostal muscles are the, are the muscles around, in and around, on top of or behind ribs. Now external are the ones outside. Internal are the ones on the inside, external, internal, intercostal muscles. Now the, the, the trickiest part about remembering which one is which is you know, when it lies in remembering that muscle can only ever pull. And if you are pulling something, you can only ever be you know, moving something towards you. Okay, a muscle can't push. A muscle can only pull something towards it. So if we've got external intercostal muscles on top of our rib cage, then they're able to pull the ribs towards them because they're on the outside of them. So external intercostal muscles, they're on the outside of the ribs and they contract and pull this rib cage upwards and outwards. You can do it now. If you just take a big breath in, notice how your rib cage moves. It comes up and out up and out. Well, that's your external intercostal muscles lifting your rib cage up and out. So if we combine these two things, diaphragm flattening, external intercostal muscle lifting up and out, what we've just done is increase the space inside of what's called the thoracic cavity. This space inside of our torso, the space behind our ribs where the lungs are attached and hang. So we've just increased the volume. Now what we know when it comes to pressure is that things like to move from areas of high density to areas of low density. Now the, the analogy that I always give is imagine that you went to I don't know, some sort of gathering or a party or wherever and there's two rooms next to each other and separated by a door. 
and no one knows about the second room. Okay, no one's opened the door yet. And everyone, 100, 100 people, piled in into room number one. Okay, it's, it's not, the most, not the most comfortable, it's very busy, very congested, but that's the only option, so everyone stays there. Now, if that door between room one and room, room two was suddenly opened, where are most people going to go? They're probably going to see the space and see it as a more attractive option. There's more space to go there. If anything, the hustle and bustle of one room could actually force them and push them through the door into this new space until that room, room number two, has got just as many people in as room one. And suddenly, it's no longer more attractive to move into that room because it's just as busy over there than it is there. In fact, if there was a, if there was a, a, a real influx of people into room two, well, suddenly some people might decide to turn around and go back until eventually there's no more movement and the rooms are balanced. Well, that's how pressure or air pressure moving in and out of our body works as well. Think of the air as being room one. We've got dense air particles, high density, high pressure. It's very congested in the air around us. Now, if we were to suddenly create this massive space inside of our lungs, that's the equivalent of opening the door between those two rooms. And suddenly the air around us is being invited and drawn into this new space where it's less congested until that room stops expanding and it's just as busy inside room two, inside our lungs, it's just as busy in there as it is outside. And suddenly, well, there's, there's no more transfer. And that's when we stop inhaling. So if you were to do that now, it feels like you're just breathing. But what you're actually doing is increasing the space inside of your thoracic cavity. The air pressure is dropping, and as that air pressure is dropping, air from outside of you is being invited and drawn inside because of this low pressure zone. High pressure outside, low pressure inside. We have this movement from high pressure to low pressure. And if you increase the volume of something without increasing how much is inside of it, well, there's more space. There's less pressure between the particles inside of it. Overall effect, air rushes in. So that is inspiration at rest. Now, like I said at the start of this grid, once you know one of them, you'll start to notice reflections and inverses of each, of each grid in, in the rest of them. So if we now look at expiration at rest, well, the diaphragm had flattened. Now it relaxes and returns to its resting shape. The external intercostal muscles had just contracted to inspire. Now they relax. The rib cage that had just moved up and out now is dropped in and down. Thoracic cavity, which had just increased, now decreases. Air pressure, which had just dropped when we breathed in, now increases slightly as we compress that thoracic cavity back in, as it drops and we start to reduce the space. I'm pretty sure there was an episode, no, not an episode, well, yeah, it was an episode, but uh, one of the Star Wars films where you've got this, clo this, this, this room which is closing in, almost like, a, almost like a garbage compactor sort of thing. But if you were in a room that was sliding in and it was becoming more and more condensed and there was a route out, are you going to stay in the room or are you going to move to the, spe uh, to the area of high or more space? You're going to go to the area of more space. Same with air. As this thoracic cavity reduces in space, the pressure inside, the distance between all the air particles reduces. It gets higher pressure. And we know air moves from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So we've got high pressure inside of us, low, relatively low pressure, air escapes, air is moved out. So that's resting, inspiration, expiration. You'll notice we just contract the diaphragm, then relax the diaphragm. Contract the external intercostals, relax the external intercostals. Move the rib cage up and out, 
drop it down and in. Increase thoracic cavity volume, decrease thoracic cavity volume. And the result of all of that is this change in air pressure. And that is what allows us, well, it leads to pulmonary ventilation. This exchange of air from inside the body to outside the body. So we start exercise. Now we're looking at the green zone. In exercise, how does all of this change when we start to exercise? And that is a big word, which you've probably just seen. Sternocleidomastoid. These muscles. If you were to open your mouth and sort of tent it up, or what you can do is if you put your thumbs on your sides, just above your collarbone there, or like that, and then take a sharp breath in, you can feel those muscles stick out. There, that's your sternocleidomastoid sort of connecting sort of underneath underneath your earlobes here, sort of around sort of the sort of towards the posterior of your jaw, that's where they're sort of connecting, and they, they're sort of inserted towards the top of your root cage here. So when they contract, they're pulling upwards, they pull up. And what we notice is well if we need to inspire, we need to move the rib cage up and out. So we've now got extra muscles additional respiratory muscles getting involved. That's the difference, really. We've still got the diaphragm flattening. We've still got the external intercostal muscles lifting up and out. We've now got extra help from sternocleidomastoids, scaling muscles, pectoral minors, with these additional muscles which are connected onto our rib cage, and they can just help contract and lift the rib cage up faster and to a bigger degree. And if we can do that, we increase the size of the thoracic cavity, both to the extent that it does increase and the speed at which it increases it too. Overall impact, air pressure drops because we've got an increasing space. Air rushes in, we breathe. And if there's more space to fill, we breathe more in. The pressure drops really quickly air moves in faster. So that's inspiration during exercise. And now, if we just flip it over for the expiration in exercise, we've got additional muscles coming into play. But we can't use the same ones because muscles can only pull one way. So the sternocleidomastoid scalenes and pectoralis minor, they, they have contracted in exercise to inspire. Now they must relax and drop the rib cage. Meanwhile, muscles underneath and below the rib cage, abdominals, obliques, internal intercostal muscles, they now contract and they pull that rib cage down and in. So it's this constant tug of war. I've often said, you know, if you had I've got a door just there, if you wanted to open and close a door and it wasn't automatic, well, you could get two ropes tie both ends to either side of the door handle and you would just pull one and then the other and then one and then the other. That's what that's what these, these pairs of muscles are doing, these groups of muscles. Sternocleidomastoid, pectoralis minor, scaling, external intercostal muscles, pull up and out, and then obliques, abdominals, internal intercostal muscles, pull down, pull up, pull down, pull up, pull down. And by doing that, we increase thoracic cavity, reduce thoracic cavity. Drop air pressure, increase air pressure. And it's just this constant toing and froing. So definitely, if you pause it, get this down, get this grid down, go back to the slides, revise and recap this grid, the mechanics of breathing, how we get air in, how we breathe, and how it changes from rest to exercise. The overall impact of this shift from red to green, from rest to exercise, well, we breathe more frequently and we breathe deeper. We increase breathing rate and we increase tidal volume. Therefore, minute ventilation increases. So we're now getting more oxygen in and we can get rid of more CO2, more buses. Alright, move myself, uh, do I need to move myself? There we go. Oh. Where are we? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Move 
stuff there. So, we've got lung volumes. We've already covered the definition, we've covered the mechanics of breathing. Now it's down to how does it change? Or what is happening inside of our body which causes what changes? So, we've got the green box here to start with. Breathing rate and tidal volume increase proportionately to the exercise intensity, duration, and well, in sustained physical activity. So what, what I mean by that is if exercise gets harder, then our minute ventilation has to match the level of difficulty or the level of hardness, or the demand for oxygen and the production of CO2 that's going on inside the body. So we have to increase both breathing rate and tidal volume because we need a greater minute ventilation, this volume of air coming in or out per minute. So in high intensity interval activity, it's, it's, not always, it's, not, it's not instantaneous. It's not as soon as you start running, bang, we've got minute ventilation increased and it's ready to go. It doesn't work like that. The body's a little bit, I mean, it's amazing, but it's a little bit slow. There's a bit of a lag time between you doing something and your body realizing that you've just done it and then responding appropriately to what you just did, if that makes sense. So if you were to go for a run, that first minute, that first minute, you could, you could, you could go sprinting off. That after the first step, your breathing rate isn't going to be, be high enough. Your tidal volume isn't going to be high enough. It's gradually going to increase until it gets to a point and you sustain that activity that it realizes it's now matching demands. Then we start to see that plateau. But until we do reach that plateau, we have this increase, this gradual increase in breathing rate, this gradual increase in tidal volume, so that we can begin to supply the muscle with a little bit more oxygen and get rid of a little bit more CO2. And it's only when our receptors inside of our body, so the, 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 almost the, the, the nervous system that can detect how hard our body is working, we'll, we'll cover those in more detail another time, but it's when they begin to detect that nothing's changing, either increasing or decreasing, that's when the body knows that how it's responded is matching the demands. So it's waiting for this balance. But until we reach that balance, we see this increase, this gradual increase of frequency of breaths and the depth of breaths, how much volume of air we breathe in or out per time. So if we look at the red box now, so as respiration increases to supply the working muscles with exercise, more oxygen is required to sustain that aerobic respiration. That's what we were just talking about. If you look at that graph there, that's, that's our breathing increasing in depth and frequency, our breathing rate and our tidal volume. Towards the end of that, where we've got these big breaths in, frequently occurring, that is the, is the response that the, that the brain and the body has, has elicited based on what's going on in the muscles, based on the volume of O2 getting sucked out of the blood, based on the volume of CO2 being dumped back into the blood. So the brain's always detecting these changes and it's causing the respiratory system to respond accordingly. To get those mechanics of breathing moving from rest to exercise, to start including the obliques and the abdominals, or the internal intercostals, the sternocleidomastoids, the scalenes, the pectoral minors. So as soon as we start to exercise, some changes occur, but the, the amount of change, that's the crux of this, the amount of change is dictated by the intensity and, and duration of the exercise, because that dictates the demands inside of the body for oxygen and the production of CO2 and lactic acid. So now would be a would be a good opportunity to uh, to pause this session, and I think we're going to leave it. We're going to leave it here today. So. That's a lot of information, so I'd rather, I'd rather pause here than, than go trundling on ahead um, and sort of adding even more words. So we're going to pause here for today. So what I would like you to do is get to grips with the spirometer trace. So get 
to grips with the spirometer tray. So if you can, watch this on, on a bit of a repeat or, re or replay. Go back to the first couple of slides where we had that spirometer trace reading. And what I would like you to do is on your, on your own spirometer trace, identify where the performer utilised their inspiratory and expiratory reserve volume. So this is what you can do. Let's get rid of this. So you need to create, create your axes first. So just one and two. And almost just have, almost picture yourself going for a run or picture yourself going for some exercise. And what I want you to do is think about when and how much you start to change your breathing. So start off resting and then just before sport, you'll probably start to see a bit of nerves and then it'll come up to here. And then we have half time, and then we've got the second half if we're playing a, an invasion game. So you can draw a spirometer trace, and then once you've got that, that's when you can go through your TV, your IRV, your ERV, your residual volume, your total lung capacity, and your vital capacity. Your six main definitions, and what you can start to do is then, if you were to number them, and try and draw on and complete your own spirometer trace. Just get to grips with using these definitions and plotting them and seeing when and where breathing occurs on a spirometer trace. Okay, then the third part, what causes expiration to change from passive process to an active one? Now, I think I've dropped these words a couple of times, didn't really explain in too much detail, but they go back to the mechanics of breathing grid. Have a look at where those words come up, active and passive. And I want you to have a little think. We'll cover it in the next lesson. But have a think, why? Oh, not so much why, but what's the benefit? I'll just increase here. What's the benefit of turning expiration active? Why does it help? And I'll give you a little bit of a clue. If we were to increase inspiration, gravity, inspiration, gravity, dropping that root cage back down, or would it be better to inspire and expire? Inspire, expire, inspire, expire, inspire, expire. So that's all I'm gonna say, but hopefully that prompted some thoughts as to why active and passive can kind of elicit different benefits with uh, with respiration. So, where is so we'll hold it there. Pause the video or stop the video. Well, the video will be stopping. Um, and give these get these questions a go. The slides will be below this video in the link, so you can uh, you can access those on, on Google Slides. I think it will be, and you can go back through and have a look at these questions. Get to grips with the spirometer. Draw that down. Have a little think about how those definitions apply to a spirometer trace. And then lastly, active and passive. How does active expiration help a performer? And if you do those three things, you should have a quality grasp on you know, the, the introduction to the respiratory system. So I hope that was of use. Um, it was yeah, great, to, great to deliver it. Uh, obviously, if you're watching this from inside the portal, then you know, the slides will be in and around or, or next to this next to this video and any relevant worksheets as well. If you're watching this live, then what you can, or, or, on, or on replay on YouTube, what you can do to learn a little bit more is head over to the PEtube.com where we do lots of a stuff and GCSE stuff and BTEC things, one-to-ones, groups, tuition, everything. Uh, so yeah, head over to the PEtube.com and yeah, you can learn, learn a little bit more about what we do and how we might be able to support you as a teacher or student uh, in, your, in your PE studies. So I look forward to uh, next time and if you can join us and yeah, see you later. Have a good one.